Maltby Colliery, between Rotherham and Doncaster, South Yorkshire, is one of the few working deep mine pits in Yorkshire. Maltby is a vast complex after everything is taken into account, from nearby quarries to old spoil heaps. Like its more distant neighbour, Kellingley Colliery, it helps feed the huge coal-fired power stations alongside the air, cold and navigation as it flows onward to the Humber estuary. Recently, these big power stations, especially Drax, the biggest CO2 polluter in the country, has become the target of the contemporary climate camp protesters. Maltby is a hub of often frenetic activity, as the shots of these big dumper trucks testify. Moreover, and thankfully, this piece of industrial excavation has been spared the open cast treatment, which increasingly is the loss of coal everywhere in northern England, Scotland and Wales. These operations are now being resisted by local communities everywhere, though their activities have not yet achieved the profile they need to acquire. More imaginative tactics are necessary if we are to get something of the clean coal technology urgently required. What we are looking at here, though, is a new inflection, a new featuring of the spoil done by British coal, itself influenced by the recent appalling makeovers elsewhere in this area, and which we have filmed and commented on before. Note the benign rolling hill design and the lack of escarpment. A spurious downland ryegrass, courtesy of some horticultural company, will surely follow, and all the increasingly rich biodiversity, which quite quickly begins to thrive on this barren shell, will be killed off before even gaining much of a toehold. However, this makeover backs onto the old spoil, which hopefully will not be meddled with by the landscape designers and are now crippled Royal Bank of Scotland. Here we see that refreshing spoil covered with natural self-regeneration together with this typical sparse car woodland of hawthorn and birch. Here is a sudden deep escarpment, a variety, most likely, of half-formed chalk on which exquisite plants often bloom. In this area, as Strata Smith noted in the late 18th century, the coal measures lay deep beneath a covering of variegated chalk. After traversing the rim of this giant spoil heap a little distance away, we spied an allotment area. Bit by bit, what we were looking at became more obviously oddball. Nay more, a lot more, because people were living here, reshaping the area for themselves. We immediately began to refer to this amazing place as the Maltby Favela. Allotments in mining areas always were fascinating places, full of strange twists and turns, often becoming out-of-kilter living spaces, inhabited day and night by willing refugees from the stifling atmosphere of the increasingly unclear nuclear family. We have never tired of mentioning our signalman Grandar turned his mini allotment at the base of his signal cabin into an enchanted garden where he sometimes would happily bed down, escaping a fierce Yorkshire matriarch with one or two of his pigs. The allotment had spread up over into the signal cabin proper as the levers and moor system became transformed instruments in a veritable jungle of plants, so that decades later, a photograph of the cabin became a tourist postcard commemorating the interior landscape of Old Whitby. Note the smoking chimney. The geese and hens, the twists and turns of unpaved alleys and snickets, bordered by plyboard sheets or corrugated materials, etc., you could get hold of in any dump. In the background, the anodyne remake of the spoil heap never seems to stop, fronted by a hillside of giant nettles, at times six foot high, spreading in all directions. Quite frankly, we'd never seen nettles like this, and most likely the consequence of nitrates plus incessant warm rain as global warming intensifies. The favela is situated right in front of a 1950s council housing estate, where no doubt miners still live, like as though the sprawling chaotic urbanism developing slowly in front of them happened accidentally outside all planning laws. What most likely happened was the council turned a deaf ear as old containers, grain silos and the like appeared overnight, as the trucks on the spoil hill above still endlessly rearranged the burnt shell. People indeed live here who have no wish to turf nature out of the window or prevent the mice from scurrying about, cats can do that, or insects invading everywhere. 
In and among this, you find huge discarded tyres, on which a five-spot burnet caterpillar heading for pupation lies motionless on a toughened rubber base right next to those lived-in shacks. A harmony of oddball nature and oddball humankind. We thought the allotments near the pit on Thorn Wastes were amazing until we stumbled on Maltby years later. For sure, on those allotments near Thorn Pit, you could see exactly why Bunting's beavers became an almost unstoppable direct action eco force of local people resident in Moor End's pit village, given a constant two fingers up to all external authority. Somehow, a changed, diverted environment has brought with it a greater passion for real communication between people. Surely something of this must also be true of this favela. In recognition of this, we were discreet in not videoing too much or dwelling on the ins and outs of this fascinating topography, as we had no desire to put the backs up of those living here who have obviously set their faces against the modern and postmodern world. This inspiring environment couldn't help but bring comparisons. Something perhaps like Factor Cheval's Fairy Palace at Autorives in mid France, but this won't do either. But then, isn't Maltby something better? Something that perhaps could easily become a possibility everywhere, simply because these living spaces are artless, serving a practical purpose for those who live differently, and where money isn't the be-all and end-all of everything, and unlike the Fairy Palace, this is not an arena for display. We are not suggesting we all go live in makeshift shacks, but the Maltby favela is a space put together by the possibly squatter tenants themselves without recourse to the excrescences of designers, town planners, architects, subcontractors' building plans or any other statist or parastatist officialdom. Places like these remain as pointers to the moment revolutionary people's assemblies, armed with a contemporary revolutionary critique, redirect the environment away from the dead spaces of contemporary housing estates, offices, shopping malls, prestige artifacts and roads demanded by an imperious capitalism colonising the totality of our everyday lives. Moreover, all modern construction techniques are today little more than a variant of planned obsolescence, part of the creative destruction cycle of the seemingly endless display of fictitious capital. Here we have the old Maltby terrain, where the dingy skipper thrives, living side by side with other invertebrates like this oak egger caterpillar, in and about sparse vegetation, on an often bare background, and where even marshy hollows allow a display of teasel. True, we took with us a plant of bird's foot trefoil on which had been deposited eggs of a dingy skipper and back they went to a room in Bradford where we slowly observed their evolution. On the 18th of June 2008, we noticed one caterpillar forming inside an egg and started filming at about 2100 hours. There was no activity and the little creature seemed to be resting. However, as soon as a light was put on the egg, it seemed to activate the caterpillar inside. At 2140 hours, the embryonic caterpillar shifted from the left to the middle of the egg. At 2205, 
there was no movement. By 2220, there was a little movement. The emerging caterpillar seemed to pause for breath or was maybe devouring the inside of the eggshell as perhaps this activity was slightly less arduous than eating through the eggshell. By 2220, there was a little movement. The emerging caterpillar seemed to pause for breath or was maybe devouring the inside of the eggshell as perhaps this activity was slightly less arduous than eating through the eggshell. Two hours later, at 0050, there was still no movement. It seemed very odd, as though it was dead. This was the same state of play with the other eggs. At 3.20 hours, there was again some movement, especially when two halogen lights were switched on. Then it was back to the lifelessness again. Note the changing colour of the egg, from brightish orange dulling to a drabbish brown as the young caterpillar matured inside, the embryo showing a transparent green underside. Finally, the caterpillar cracks open the egg top and a black head slightly produced slowly, eating away at the eggshell, its first meal and rich in nutrients. Just look at its young jaws moving in a growing twilight, slowly eating it away, as the munching becomes more and more determined. And then everything goes quiet with no more munching, just an occasional slight movement and the noise in the background. Finally, a black head pokes through the shell top as the caterpillar finally clears the shell 
and moves away from the egg. Moving away, the caterpillar munches away at the surface of the bird's foot trefoil leaves, never fully cutting through. Only the veins of the leaves are left, leaving a membrane like when leaves rot down. The veins must be made of a harder material, less digestible. First skin cast. The larval head is brown rather than back. Here we see the faeces of the young caterpillar. Caterpillar then begins to spin a web of something like silken twine sometime after the first skin cast. The caterpillar seems to be weaving a tent after appearing to devour its skin cast. We would say this Mortby favela opens on to a new world, incomparably more alive with possibilities than the mundane, barren, urban existence we are forced to consume daily. For sure, the basic amenities and quality hygiene are lacking, but that can be put right quickly without disturbing ambience. As the many insects move almost invisibly evolving beneath our feet, creating a rich biodiversity we must now consciously interact with if humanity is to survive the pending holocaust as suicide capitalism is now unleashing.
you may say this anti-film with no storyline is chaotic, collaging almost abstract theory about subversive urbanism and ecology, together with nearly invisible forms of life, only observable through the microscope. But why not range like this? For after all, it is nothing more than dialectical movement that is the essence of our daily perceptions. Here we have, on the 21st of June, 2008, the caterpillar compressed between leaf membranes, spinning the thinnest of yarns, beginning with a single thread, woven gradually into something thicker over time. Tracy has said with this voiceover that most of it could have been put a lot simpler. Why shouldn't you have left aside all complicated revolutionary suppositions and simply say you enjoy broken down buildings with trees growing out the brickwork, slums in general, minus the intergang drug fuel violence, of course, that mars most of them, down on dirty landscapes, dwellings alive with insects and fungi, and so much more besides. Well, yes, all that is true, too.